Hello, my fine friends. Welcome to another edition of Raha Lastapa. This week with the fantastic and multi-talented Andy Osho. Look, we're doing some Raha Lastapas live in a theatre with an actual physical audience in May, June and July at the Clapham Grand. Go to richardherring.com slash gigs to find the dates and the ticket links. If you can't make the theatre or if it sells out because it will be social distance so it won't be a capacity venue... Um, you can pay to see the live streams of those shows as well. If you can't afford to pay, they will ultimately be released as podcasts, but maybe with some stuff edited out, if you want the live fun and joy of all the goss, watch them live, either in the theatre or at home, richardherring.com slash gigs. I'll be announcing the guests as soon as I get them. First of all, it will go to the monthly badges, gofasterstripe.com slash badges. Uh, you'll get that's just one of the many benefits and extras and gifts you get for being a monthly badger three pounds a month and uh, you'll be helping us make more podcasts as well and what else i'm feeling quite well uh this is slightly out of order so this was actually recorded uh before the dominic diamond one but uh, yeah, there may be some confusion about where i am in my long process in my difficult fight against cancer been pimpsy <laughs> thank you very much the nhs uh, i've been extremely lucky uh do keep checking your bits everyone do keep checking them it's testicular cancer month awareness month i you know i was made aware of it quite uh brutally uh this year so i don't need a month myself but maybe you do check all your bits stick your finger up your ass you know it's fun if nothing else it's fun i don't know what you're looking for up there but um you know you can give it a go um we're carrying on with Twitch on uh, Mondays. Usually we've got a snooker, Wednesdays, Rahala Stippers, and Thursdays. Twitch of Fun, which is a lot of fun. It's got fun in the title, and uh, I'm very much enjoying those. Come and see those things for free if you would like. Anyway, let's sit back, relax, and enjoy Rahala Stipper with Andy Osho. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a man who's a bona fide legend of lockdown. It's Richard Herring. Hello. Welcome to... Look, I'm a legend of lockdown. Hooray, I'm a legend. That makes up for losing a testicle. So welcome to Richard Herring's uh, lovely standard telegraphing patriotism. Uh, that's behind me. Is that a standard is another word for flag. And I'm just proving that I'm proud to be British because it's very important to prove that right now. And I don't think anyone's got a bigger flag than that. So I am the best. Uh, but I was hanging around with the crew of the Ever Given container ship on the Suez Canal this week. I bet them they couldn't go all the way up the canal sideways. They took the bet on. They were great lads. I don't know how they got on. Um, uh, anyway, they call it Rahalastafa. So I don't know if that's going to catch on. Uh, thank you to everyone for voting for me for that Chortle Award. Um, that's very lovely. I do deserve it. And I'm delighted that Chris Evans, not that one, is not included in the award. <laughs> he does not deserve it. He's done nothing. Nothing! So um, I'd like to give him my own award. But, you know, I can't be bothered to sort it out. So, um, yes, look... Um, Look, thank you for all the concern about my health as well. Uh, nearly, I mean, I'm going to be talking about this a lot, okay? So <laughs> strap in. It's, it's going to be on my mind for a while. There's going to be a stand-up show. There's going to be a podcast. There's going to be a book. There's going to be a sitcom about it. It's going to. It's all going to happen. Um, so, you know, skip through this if you, if you don't want to hear about <laughs> my bollocks. But I, I'm nearly back to normal, though. It's four weeks to the day since the operation, as we're recording this. And my ball is yet to grow back, which I am a bit concerned about. Uh, people are always talking about growing some balls, being manly. Uh, it's uh, Let's put up that graphic. I've got the right one. Uh, oh, it's not going on. Oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, this kind of quite unpleasant, actually. You can buy a thing saying grow your balls, don't be a pussy. That's what I'm talking about. It's like that horrible idea that somehow masculinity is... Uh, it, 
contained and strength is contained within these weakest fucking things that you could possibly <laughs> ever imagine. Um, don't be a pussy. What's stronger than a pussy? Nothing is stronger than a pussy either. And I'm thinking about the cats, uh, but also the other kind of pussies is better. Uh, it seems I'm uh, too, uh, so I'm macho. I can't even grow one ball. People and, and presumably all those tough men out there grow multiple balls. Uh, some, grow some balls certainly implies more than a couple. Presumably they had two to start with. So they're walking around with scrotums bulging with testes. And however much I hold breath and push, my diaphragm still just want rattling around there like a hermit crab in an oversized shell. Um, maybe I'm trying to rush things. Even a ham hand uh, grows back only after one month. So maybe I've got to work uh, work it out. Um, I, I didn't take the prosthetic. That might be what a prosthetic looks like if you're watching the video. Uh, but um, uh, I'm slightly regretting it now because there is it, there's a lopsided element to it. On one side, it's noticeably nothing there, and then you turn around the other side uh, is you know like normal uh, at the moment. And um, it do, I have thinking maybe there's a bit of variety acting it. You know those uh, old acts that used to be sort of half man, half woman. <laughs> they turn one way and then they turn the other way and they be a, a woman. And then they turn the other way and be a man. Maybe I can do one where you know I turn one way. I'm a five year old boy. I turn the other way, I'm a grown grown man. Just it's a testicle based variety act. I'm not sure <laughs> whether that will work out or not. I can't be sure whether I'd be allowed to do that. It seems distasteful. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, look, I I have lost a ball, so I am going to go on. And, and I know every time I say I tell someone this, they say, "Have you looked in the last place you saw it?" And I'm like, "Yes, of course I have." They're just trying to help, but it's annoying every single person. They go, oh, "Have you looked in your scrotum?" As if I wouldn't have looked in my scrotum. I say, yeah, my, my scrotum was the first place I looked for it. It's not there. That's why it was weird. But people are odd and they invariably, they say, do you mind if I check? I say, look, it's definitely, I've definitely checked my scrotum. You don't lose a ball and then not look for it in your scrotum. Do you think I'm stupid? And they say, just let me have a feel. You might have missed it. And I go, all right, all right, go ahead. But believe me, it's not there. And they're like immediately, oh, look, I found it. Sometimes you just need a second <laughs> pair of eyes, don't you? And I say, no, you haven't. That's the other one. And they're all, what, you had two? And I say, yeah, of course. And then they get angry with me. Then what are you complaining about? I say, I don't think I was complaining. I was just stating the fact that I'd lost a ball. But you've still got one ball, yes. So you've still got more than the average number of balls. What do you mean? If you averaged out, most men have two balls. Most women have no balls. There are slightly more women than men, and some men have one or none. So I, all in all, one ball is above average in the balls department and here you are crying and sobbing about oh i've lost one of my balls you with more balls than an average person has and i say i've had testicular cancer i thought you'd be sympathetic and they say well you were very wrong about that very wrong about it so um <laughs> good so that's what i'm saying there's a lot of material <laughs> a lot of material to be had. Uh, look um, i'm having chemo on uh, friday which sounds scary doesn't it but as with all of this thing uh, it's sort of like the holodeck experience of cancer, and it's a very light chemo. I don't think it'll affect me too much, but uh, we may not be back next week. I mean, you know, if it's really bad, I might never be back, but I think it'll be okay. <laughs> we may not be back next week, but if I'm well enough and not too tired, uh, we will be back next oh week. Oh, my gosh. But let's do this week's show. My guest this week. <laughs> Oh, has to follow all that talk about balls. And it's quite, and the, the, what she's most famous for is quite apt. Uh, she's probably best known as Dr. Rogers in oh, Footballers' yes. Wives Extra Time. Um, what I like about it, that show is the the S of wives is like a dollar sign, even though footballers are generally speaking in the UK. Uh, it's a dollar sign, but the S of footballers isn't a, a dollar sign. And that's what I'm going to be talking to my guest about for the next hour. <laughs> It's the wonderful Andy Osho, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, hello. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm so excited to be reminded about that classic role, Dr. Rogers of Footballers yeah. Dollars Wives. <laughs> well, and only an extra time. So that was that was that like the late night? Was that the Hollyoaks after dark, slightly sexy? Yeah, version? I think it was on like ITV too before people started watching it as well. So I was really in the corner of the corner <laughs> of the like <laughs> and were you called Dr. Rogers as a sort of uh, carry-on style? <gasps> I just got that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You'll have to go back and do the whole thing again if you didn't, did not realise. 
I you played it wrong. Like, you were meant to be playing like Sid James. Going, whoa. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I will. I will check it out. I didn't. I didn't catch it uh, myself, but I will try and find that. It must be on YouTube somewhere, right? You put it, it's not in it's not in your show reel, I don't think. I look Yeah, I it's weird, isn't it? That yeah. one didn't make it in. I think it got nudged out by insert other obscure role that I've played at some point. <laughs> hey, you've done a I mean, that's what's amazing about you, Andy. I know you your comedy well and I've uh, seen you perform a few times. And I was you know, and I knew I well, you know, I had actually spotted you uh, as I'd mentioned before we started on the on my favourite TV show. Death in Paradise, you know, you, you may be thinking people are going to pick up on I May Destroy You or some of the some of the highbrow stuff you've done. But I saw you in Death in Paradise. It was it, it was hard to recognize you. You were playing a role uh, unlike I'd seen you before. Uh, and, yeah, I, I, was, um, I was also carrying holiday weight as well. So <laughs> that was that. <laughs> but you are, you are great. And Death in Paradise is my, uh, you know, ultimately I would like to be the detective, obviously. Right. Um, but I would, you know, it'd be nice to be one of the pasty English men who comes over and <laughs> his friend gets involved in a murder. I tell you what, uh, you want to be a, a victim. That is yeah. a nice job to get because they fly you over for two weeks and then the victim sort of dies probably like day two. And then they're basically on holiday in Guadeloupe <laughs> for <laughs> another 10 days. And then they have to do a little bit of filming at the end. It's a very, very nice gig. <laughs> I have wondered about that. So I, that's definitely what I'll go for. I have seen. I was watching one the other day with Jason Manford in it. They, they right. do employ quite a lot of uh, comedians. Uh, in the show, usually the the uh, the detective is uh, often been a comedian. Um, That's true, yeah. So uh, yeah, so that would be. I mean, I just really fancy going and sit. I don't really want to do the filming. I just fancy sitting. Every time I watch it, I just think oh, I'd love to be sitting in that little bar by the sea, drinking so, beer. So you just want to go to Guadeloupe? Yeah, for, you know, <laughs> okay. and, be, and be paid <laughs> and, and get be free paid. beer. Yes, okay, that is a big difference. Yeah, yeah, I and see what be, you're saying. <laughs> and try and work out if I'm the murderer or not. That would be yeah. exciting. Yeah, do they yeah. let you know before? Were you the? Oh, we, we don't want to do too many spoilers. You weren't the murderer in your episode, were you? Were you? I no. It's. I think it's no. been a year since that's gone out. No, yeah. I, I wasn't the murderer, but they made me look very suspicious. They make every. That's the thing. Yeah. It's a dangerous island to go to. There's always a murder, <laughs> and I, I don't know why the murderers. They're always so inventive in their murders. I think if they just bat, bat, bash someone over the head and ran away, <laughs> they'd probably get away with it. But they make it look. Suspicious. There's always three people who are, who are in the frame. It's kind of weird the way it's always exactly the same <laughs> every week. I do want to be on it. I'm, like, not, I'm not. I'm not knocking it. Right. Um, but you know, they they go to an island where there's a detective who's very good at sorting out that sort of crime. Yeah. I would say that's the last place to go and do like a convoluted thing where you've worked out a way of making it look like you were. It's always the person who wasn't there, basically. Although they, the last one I saw, they did bump that and. It wasn't the person who wasn't there, but usually, if a person is as far away as possible, right. they did it. They did it. Right. That's that's, <laughs> the, that's the death of power. Whoever seemingly seems the furthest <laughs> yeah. from the crime, it couldn't possibly be there. It's them. It's them. It's them. I got, it. got it. Got it. Got it. Did you have? Fun? Was it a fun? Was it a fun job? Anyway, I know you were working for the full two weeks, but did you have a nice? <laughs> A bit I of time did on the beach. work the whole time. Well, <laughs> almost. I mean, we did manage to do a little bit of snorkeling in that. But um, yeah, it's a lovely job, you know. And you, the the team are like lovely. Ralph, had, I think he just started when we got oh, there. Right. So he was sort of, you know, finding his feet and was great as Neville. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd advise you to do it. Yeah, I'll go try. for it, mate. <laughs> Were you slightly offended at taking you so long to be in it? Given that it's a show that does employ every single black actor working <laughs> in the UK, right. where you're waiting by the phone, going, "When am I going to be on Deaf in Paradise?" Exactly, it's almost like a rite of passage, isn't it, for black <laughs> actors? Like that's why they have to go through comedians as well, because it's like, oh, we've used up all the black actors, so now it's like, who can we get next? But um, well, yeah, it's nice to have done it. That's for sure. You've done it, and that's it. Yeah. It doesn't matter what else happens in your career, Andy. You've no one can take Death in Paradise or Footballers Wives that extra time away. Exactly, from you. and that everything else is just gravy now it's quite interesting because you um you you started off well you started off on the other side of the camera you were in sort of production and post-production and yeah. working on that side and but yeah. you had had you been to drama school before that as well you went to a couple of drama schools right well I studied acting like when I was 18 so um a lot of my friends we all did similar um similar courses but some of them went off to drama school after that to like full-time train but I just didn't think that that was something that I could do I just I had gaslit myself basically into thinking <laughs> people like you don't get to do stuff like that. So I went and 
got a job working in post-production. So it wasn't like for years, uh, I'd been doing that for like 10 years. And that's when I thought, you know what, I really want to give the acting thing a go. And I left my sort of nicely paid job and all the rest. It was, it was crazy. Like looking back, it was sort of such a mad thing to do, but you know, and you just like, you just feel it in you that that's, that's what's next. I think that happened. That happens to quite a few people. I think they kind of get ten years into a, in a proper job, and if they've been creative or they've always harboured that desire, then you're sort of approaching thirty, and you're thinking, "Is this going to be it?" Yeah. And so it's, and I think when you're still in your twenties or your thirties or your forties, really, you can <laughs> you can still have a crack and go, "Look, I'm going to give this a go." And I think that's kind of quite nice if you've. So I mean, I understand it was a big step, but it's quite nice to establish yourself and get a bit of security and then go, okay, let's just take a crazy risk. Because yeah. you could have gone back, really. They'd have had you back, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was freelancing as well anyway, so I could have, like, you know, <laughs> tricked someone to give me a job in post-production. But, but you know, I, it's funny because I was, I was actually approaching... 30 when it happened as well yeah. and it wasn't like a it wasn't like a sensible choice of like mm, now I've got to this point in my career and I've got a nice little nest egg or whatever I'd like to try acting it was just like I'm so bored right <laughs> I mean, just this is not what I'm meant to be doing yeah. what can I do about that and then because I was working on a show where um, there were a load of actors on site so production and post-production was all on the same site so I got to know the actors and I think they're they're responsible for this basically <laughs> it's all their fault so you know getting to know them it made me realize oh this is I could actually do this I don't know how but it is something that I might be able to do sure so it was more acting I mean you sort of gone full circle because you started out as an actor and you were you were doing you know you went back, back 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 to drama school. Was that was it the first drama the drama when you the course that you were in with Idris Elba? It must have been I guess must it was it the, that you, was when you, I, when I was eighteen yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah he, so you'd um, seen him do okay he was doing all right <laughs> yeah, by yeah. Stage. and I've gone I could do that <laughs> I could be Idris Elba um, and uh, yeah so you you went to to acting first and we're doing you got quite a few roles so what was it that prompted the not the move, but also the addition, I suppose, of doing stand up. Was that was that a thought? I, I, you know, I can get some acting work out of it, or did you suddenly get bitten by the comedy bug? No, I. Um, well, there was two things. One is I love stand up, anyways. But I like a lot of people. I was like, but that's too terrifying. I would never do that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I was also not like acting work was basically drying up. And so when I was going for auditions or doing stuff, I was getting terrible stage fright. Like I remember doing um, a, a play reading or something at the Royal Court and just, it's just an invited audience. So there's only about 30 people in the room. I was tripping over my words and didn't, you know, it was all over the place. And I was like, this doesn't, I can't carry on like this. So what can I do so that I can have a bit more control over my sort of creative life, as it were? Stand up. Okay, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> That's the way to. But then eventually, I I did, um, you know, Logan Murray's infamous course, and yeah, yeah just like st I just wanted to see how it would go, and I just wanted stage time. I just wanted to be doing, you know, be a bit more in control of things, and then it sort of grew and grew and it took over <laughs> and then the next thing I'm a stand up then <laughs> yeah well you did very well very quickly because what you decided to stand up about 2007 and is that right it's about it's around yeah so my it? first gig was on the wibbly wobbly boat in March 2007 right. and I think by 2010 I think um I did my first mock the week and then by 2012, I was burnt out and I was done. <laughs> <laughs> but you've done two live at the Apollos. Yeah. You've done you've done a lot of those shows. Yeah. And so was it? Is that the last time you did stand up? I think I saw you at uh, Latitude. I think was the last time I saw you do stand up, which was a, would have been a roundabout then. I, I remember yeah. seeing you. Yeah, I think that, that sounds about right. I mean, the last time I did stand up was probably about, because I, I went to the States after that. And so I did a little bit there. And the LA scene is horrible so that you know that killed my love of uh stand-up as well but yeah I probably did that for a couple of years so I'd say probably around like 2004 something like that was probably the last time I did stand-up 2014 oh sorry 14 yeah, yeah, so yeah 2014 yeah. 15 something like that yeah cool and so what was it why what why did you stop because that's kind of quite was it just because the acting was going well and the writing was going well or was it was it know, really that you, you had enough of the the, the job I was done I was yeah, yeah I was really done <laughs> It is a hard life, as yeah. you know. It's like it's not it's not for everyone, and it's not just it's not just about being good at the job. It's there's so much more to it that is nothing to do with actually being on stage. 
And I was, if I'm honest, feeling quite uninspired by the industry in the sense of what was possible for me. And it's not to say that what people uh, are doing isn't isn't interesting or whatever. It's just when I saw that path and what was possible out of following that path, I was just like that. That's not that. That's not enough for me. Do you know what I mean? I just don't want to bounce from panel show to panel show to panel show, even though that's great work, obviously, and and it's hugely entertaining for people. It just wasn't right for me. I think stand up is a craft, and I wanted it to be an art form, almost like the sort of Richard Pryor relationship with it. But to do that, I have to be just doing that and get really good at that. But loads of opportunities thrown in your path, and you and I kept biting at them, and they were taking me down this weird path that I didn't want to go down. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Well, I think that's interesting. I think we, I know, I think that's the state of comedy as well, is that it's, well, actually, weirdly, I guess, acting and writing your own plays, which you also do, is almost the way to, to, to get into TV and do like a proper sitcom with a bit of oomph to it. That's happened, obviously, at two or three kind of more actory uh, people in Fleabag and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, I may destroy you and, and uh, chewing gum. She did before, didn't she? And it's uh, you know it's it's as a comedian, you really are. That's it, isn't it? It's either I'll let, what I'm going to do is panel shows, even or present a game show, or you know, and, and you're not. That's not really. I sort of. I, I feel very sad about it because when I started, you know, you'd think, oh, I could get my own show on the radio and then maybe we'll get a show on TV and we do stand up and do sketches or whatever you want to do. And that just doesn't really seem to be open there for anyone anymore. So, yeah, I can understand why. And, you know, I think the acting was obviously going well and the writing was going well and America's beckoning, which, again, seems to be uh, a place where a lot of black actors d- decide to decamp to yep. <laughs> because the UK is, doesn't really itch itself <laughs> as to go to America, for example. Uh, but but lots, you know, lots of, uh, of, of black comedians as well in, from the UK have gone across to America and done fantastically well out yeah. there. So it's, yeah, it, yeah. it is, is that, is there a, is that, a, a, you know, because America doesn't seem like the least racist country <laughs> in the world. <laughs> <laughs> to me, but is that does that reflect bad, does that reflect badly on the UK? Is is it is it is it is it, a, is it a problem within the industry? Do you think that? Oh gosh, I mean it's, that's such a big topic, isn't it? Because it it's is. it's not out and out that like the UK is terrible and would rather have a white actor do blackface rather than actually hire a black person. It's not that bad, but it is. It, it's just um. It's just a little bit frustrating in terms of the outlook of what's allowed. Like America, as much as they have terrible problems with race, they also um, there's lot there's loads of space for underrepresented groups. Well, they're not so underrepresented anymore in the states. They're not there yet, but there's a lot more space. Whereas I think in the UK, black you know black and ethnic minority. I'm not going to say BAME, but you know we we st- the industry is still figuring out where to place us, and also um, allowing us to break out of stereotypical ways of seeing us. You know what I mean? Like it's not all Top Boy, and I'm, there's nothing wrong with Top Boy or whatever. But we got to have other you got to represent us in other ways or give us the space to represent ourselves so we can let you know that we don't all live on council estates and we're not all, do you know what I mean? So, sure. so that's the frustration I think. And, and sometimes I, I guess black performers and artists get a bit frustrated that they can get in, but only through this really narrow lens of perception. So, so, so in the States, you, you can really get cast as any role, really. Mm. And it's much more interesting what you have access to there. But the UK is like not far behind and is learning. It is like people are in the industry making an effort. So I don't want to sort of dog on them and say, oh, you know, it's terrible because it's not. But it's just very different. America's kind of extremes, isn't it? Because they will have a black president and then they will have Trump. It's just like it, it, it's we just they go from one to that's fair, isn't it? It's have a black president and have uh, an anti black president. A white, that white is fair. nationalist. That is fair. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's fair. So that's, well, there, there could be nothing more equal than that. <laughs> I mean, that is that's equality right there and then. And how did you find obviously you've come back from America and so you're in America for three or four years or yeah, something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what was it working out for you? You did a lot of work out there and you, you were getting roles and you were in movies and TV stuff. And- yeah, yeah, it was it was good. I think that my biggest takeaway was learning stuff. So I learned about myself. I learned about the industry. And then and then the work was kind of 
secondary because it wasn't like I was, you know, flying off the shelf or anything because they got black people there anyways. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so um, for me, the takeaway was I had space to write my book, but also I just learned so much and just I gained a lot of confidence and belief in myself to really trust myself to choose the path that I want to be on rather than just get onto rails that somebody else has get onto, you know, tracks that somebody else has put down and, oh, okay, I suppose this is what I'm doing now, which is kind of how I was with comedy. It's just like, all right, these things are being offered. So obviously I'm supposed to say yes, even though I'm not really enjoying a lot of this stuff. Right. And you've come back and it's, you know, it just, uh, I'd seen the book was out and, uh, but th- since I've booked you, like, it seems you've sort of exploded all, everywhere because there's, there's a, there's the podcast you've got as well. And there's, um, we'll talk about all of this. Uh, you've just done the, a really great thing for Comic Relief where you oh, learned to be an opera singer. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're, there's, your photo is in line of duty and I'm guessing, hey. it'll be, I'm guessing it's going to be more than your photo. <laughs> but that's like, that, that's like, a, I nope, hope it isn't. That's it. I really that is... hope it isn't. I really hope they went, Andy, can we, oh, can no, we, we just had a lovely day doing loads of different photos. Oh, it was glorious. Jed was there. <laughs> Martin came in to see how we were getting on. <laughs> so that's whatever that is. And I know we can't talk about it yet. It's very exciting. Whatever may be coming there is very exciting. Let's talk about that. So let's talk about the, the comment relief thing first, which I just, oh, uh, which was like a terrifying prospect that they just, they took five comedians yeah, and comedy and uh, and uh, well, John of Jennifer Saunders, I suppose, counts as a comedian, and uh, and you counts as a comedian, uh, and um, Alex funny Brooker people, and funny people, I think, on the whole, weren't they? But yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, our, our friend uh, Caroline Quentin, who's been on the show, and Jade Adams, who's been on this show before, um, and just in a genuinely in twenty four hours, you had to learn to sing Ness and Dorma in Italian. Is it? I think yes, it is, <laughs> yes, in, it Italian. is in Italian. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it did a banging, brilliant job. If you if you haven't seen it, just there's a there's a short uh, thing on YouTube where you can see your reactions to finding out what you had to do. Oh yeah, and then and the fear in your face. You know, <laughs> all I, of your face. Yeah, I, to be honest with you, it, it probably they it, the way they cut it, they made it look like fear, but we were all just so moved. It's yeah. not even as like cool and funny as as that it was just like we we because jade said it you know no no one's heard live performance for a year and then we didn't know what was going on so we saw some people down in the stalls and the curtains were down and um then jennifer i think she turned around she's i think something's going on and the curtain went up and there was a full orchestra socially distanced and then the the singers stood up and then the tenor just sang and we just just all burst into tears because it was just so beautiful but and also Ness and Dorma when you take it away from any associations you have with football or whatever it's an incredible piece of music so yeah we were just all a bit overwhelmed <laughs> really <laughs> Caroline Quentin was like okay I'm off <laughs> and to sort of wipe the mascara away but yeah it was quite a powerful moment yeah and obviously they'd chosen you all knowing you could sing, I, I imagine, because it would have been terrible if you couldn't sing. But had you ever done anything of that level before? God, no. Uh, I mean, you know, the crazy thing as well is I have, like, I've sung in theatre shows, like not musicals, but shows that have a bit of music in them. Or, or and I did I did a little show, um, comedy and singing, comedy and songs or whatever, um, at the Vauxhall Tavern one time. But it was nothing like this because... Right. Opera singing is so freaking technical and it is a whole body thing. It isn't even just about what's happening in your throat. It's totally about, you know, your ribs being in the right place and your diaphragm and your knees being soft and all this sort of stuff. So it was it was a lot to learn. Because they didn't show. In, well, in the, in the clip I saw, I don't know if there was an, a longer thing, but they, it just cut from you leaving the theatre to you doing the song so right. I don't know, they didn't i didn't see any of the any of the process of but, the did they, did, did they, <laughs> but it but it, you know because it could, would have been funny if you, you'd not been good at it <laughs> but, and you're sort of expecting uh you know yeah probably it's you know, maybe there'll be a, maybe one of them won't be very good or maybe none of them will be very good or maybe <laughs> but actually you're all like bang on um and like i mean jade adams i thought I thought right. they might have put a record on when she came on. Do you know what I mean? Because it was so astonishing. Because I know Jade and I know she can sing, but it was just 
so like an opera singer. It was unbelievable. Oh, she, her and Caroline were amazing. I mean, Richard Curtis came up to us beforehand and said what you just said. Like, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. It could go either way. It could be funny if it's a disaster. And we're like, all right, mate, thanks for the, you know, <laughs> vote of confidence. But, you know, it, as it turns out, everyone was great. I, it, there it was, was just great. such a lovely team to 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 do that with and just to put yourself out there way outside your comfort zone it was a real experience well it's doing it live as well that's the you know it's not even just like we're going to do it you're going to do it live if you fuck this up oh. that's that's it it's live tv everyone's going to see you know that i love alex just did his bit and then the biggest smile you've ever seen anyone get. Oh, when he got brilliant. through it it was just you know so you could <laughs> you knew everyone was nervous and you knew you could sense the sort of relief when it all worked out but yeah it's great if, do check it out if you if you oh cool it. that's really funny i haven't seen it so i didn't know that but yeah i mean because as, as the as they gave the countdown because you could hear it in the studio i could because i was all right and then as soon as the countdown started legs started shaking you know what i mean like yeah, I, I, it was man. terrifying absolutely terrifying well well done it was and you know rarely for comic relief it was very entertaining <laughs> Nice um, on comic relief. Thank you. That comic relief are great. They're great. But <laughs> get on, come on. Um, it, you know, it's rare that it, it. It's rare, I think, that it like it impresses you. <laughs> I have to say, it is, there's loads of funny stuff on it. There's some stuff. I mean, there's some stuff that's not meant to be funny, right? I don't think you're meant to be laughing at the little films in between. But they don't play those for very, laughs. No. They don't play those for laughs. I mean, you know, I'm sometimes I'm laughing. Um, and uh, your podcast, which is a very, you know, I've listened to a couple of episodes of your podcast today, uh, Creative Source. Yeah. And so, where, where, what was the impetus to start this up? Is this this is quite a new thing, right? Or is yeah, this, this during yeah. lockdown? I well, I started doing these as a live stream on Instagram probably about two years ago now. Right. And so every Sunday, basically, I would have a conversation with whoever showed up and we would talk about a different topic to do with being a creative. And then afterwards, I was like, I feel like this has more life in it. And I was going to just take the audio and, you know, put that out as a podcast because I did 50 of them in the end. And then I thought, no, start again, because I was I was kind of conversing with people and chatting and going, oh, hi, Ian, how you doing? You know, which probably isn't going to make great audio like for a podcast. So I thought start again, start the conversation again and just say what I want to say today about those topics. So it's basically all about creativity and, you know, I take a different topic every week and just talk about it and hopefully help people feel a bit more inspired and like, not motivated as in get out there and do it. It's not, I'm not a drill sergeant or, or anything like that, but it's more like here's a different way of seeing these different things so that you can empower yourself, that type of thing. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it, it, it's a very lonely thing and it's maybe especially this year if you're working, oh, creating something, you know, if yeah. you're a writer, writing anything, or if you're, you know, if you're an actor, not acting mm -hmm. uh, or whatever, you know, it's very lonely. It's really great just to hear those issues that you all have sort of, discussed openly by people who are doing well you know I think that's night you know you can say look you'll go there's one about rejection and you have Richard Osman on talking about about that you think oh you know if Richard Osman has yeah, been rejected right. at some point <laughs> then there's a there's a hope for us that we could go on to present you know 10 years of tv and write a <laughs> book that sells a million copies in a day or whatever yeah yeah, yeah uh, totally. so you know it's great you know it's good to know and it's and to look at the positives of that I think that's my sort of take home from this whole year and everything that's happened to me in the last 12 months mm. is it sort of understanding the, you know, it's, there's bad stuff, but it's, but it's taken the positives out of the negative situation to learn that lesson, I suppose, is what you've been talking about all the way through about kind of your, your own personal journey. Yeah, yeah, totally. Because the, even though this has been really a really challenging time, there are some positives that have come out of it. Like people, you know, we were talking before about you being able to have guests from different parts of the world. Yeah. That might not have been something that they would have been available to do. We wouldn't have thought to use technology in this way. So that's really good. Yeah. And I, and you know, a weird little thing is I really love seeing people walking. Like just like families out walking because yeah. it's so like back to basics because <laughs> life was so like 100 miles an hour before. So seeing people like there is literally nothing to do. <laughs> like we've, <laughs> we've completed Netflix, you know what I mean? Like the, all there is is to just like hang out with your stupid family and go for a nice walk. Yeah. So that's really lovely to see. I've really enjoyed that. And I've started doing it myself. I try and like do that every day just to be out and, you know, fresh air and be amongst people or whatever. 
Yeah, no, it's it's true. You know, it's for that, and it's, as a having kids, it's been you know, it's been hard at times to look <laughs> after them all the time, and not have schools and all that sort of stuff. But it's been really terrific as well for for just spending more time together, and the kids spending more time together, and becoming you know becoming a more of a unit most of the time. <laughs> uh, most of the time <laughs> they have their moments but you know it's been yeah i mean that's it to look at the positives and to you know when when you have something and obviously a lot of people had to cope with really terrible things this year either being ill themselves or losing uh family members but it's but it's sort of again it's <clears throat> it's about i guess understanding how fragile everything is and making the most of it while we've got it as well you know so it's my own little personal journey i've been over the last two months just thought i've come out of it feeling like so, so much happier I think in a way oh, than I was wow. before because I just sort of feel got you know like I'm not hopefully not going to die but there was a point where I thought oh is this going to kill me and and you sort of just appreciate what you've got and how lucky you are you know whatever that is I think so it's uh, you know yeah hopefully it's difficult to know it's difficult to know whether we'll all uh, come out of it and everything in a, in a year's time everyone will finally <laughs> collapse and everything will fall apart or as again we were saying before the podcast whether it will turn into a sort of I mean, I, you didn't use the word "fuck fest," but I think that's I think that's where we. I think that's. Where we're <laughs> Hopefully, I'll turn to a massive fuck fest, and uh, they'll let yeah. married people join in with that for uh, for three or four months, and then you've you earned back, it. Then you have to go back to your uh, your lives. respective lives. Yeah, um, well, yeah, sure, fuck fest. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, talking of fuck fest. Oh yeah, uh, we do. We do have a <laughs> we do have a similar backstory in our comedy shows. Oh yeah, uh, in that um, what your 2011. 11 show i think in, yeah. was about dating oh right and yeah, you yeah, would yeah. and you would uh and i'm not saying it, was a, it wasn't a good link uh and uh you you went on dates with someone from your audience after every show yeah. um i did a show uh it was a different idea uh in 2004 where i for the show i dated 50 women in 50 consecutive nights so it's a very similar thing except i did you know it wasn't part of the show it was part of the show in the end but it was before the show yeah sure sure so i had that experience of going out with loads of different people in a very what did you learn from that that is fascinating yeah well it was it was good i think it was it was good and it was terrible i mean i I was very ill afterwards because i just was drinking every night and getting pissed every night and and Uh. and and staying out as late i sort of made rules for myself and you know i and which i basically stuck to which was as long as they wanted to carry on the date i would carry on oh right (laughs) that's not a rule that's just being out (laughs) well you know but i would i I would i got very tired and but also I met a lot, I was very sort of shy about acting, asking people out or getting uh, getting into relationships with people if they made it really clear they fancied me before that. And with this, and I was really nervous even about doing this, and even though it was stupid, and it, and but because it was sort of like a game and it didn't matter, I just went on 50 dates with 50, not exactly random people, but friends of friends and people oh, who okay. were single, uh, you know, and occasionally uh, so, whatever, so someone I didn't know at all. Uh, and you know you would just and you weren't because you there was no expectations about it and because you'd spend an evening with someone you'd often have a really good time with them. so it uh-huh. became massively confusing because I met I basically had to then go on around a round of second dates with quite a lot of them and <gasps> you know so I oh, was you guilt dated and I was, them I was occasionally but all, but it was you know but also because you I, it made what we made realize is like being honest in relationships is absolutely the best thing okay and I think yeah. a lot of men especially think they have to lie and that they think women are a different breed and are yeah. looking for something different. But if you look, if you want to date 50 people in 50 nights, don't do it. It's insane. But if you <laughs> want to do it, then if you, as long as you're honest with everyone who's, who's doing it and saying, you know, this is what's going on. That's it's fine. They want to do it. That's fine. It's if you're dating 50 women in 50 nights or 50 men in 50 nights and not telling them. <laughs> do you know, is that, them. is that, cause I'm, I'm picking up on what you said about men feeling like they have to lie. Cause yeah. I'm just like, you know, playing back some of my sort of um, yeah. dating history. Do you think that's a thing for guys that they think that they have to say things that women want to hear? I think, well, this is me and I'm a bit, obviously I'm a bit older than people who are dating now. I feel my generation were brought up as men to think, like that women were there you know were sort of like this wall of resistance and they would they didn't really want to they didn't really want to have sex or, or be with you and you had to you had to persuade them or trick you know you look at all the films in the 80s and 90s the romantic comedies it's kind of people tricking people into going out right. the, you know lying about who they are and uh you know and i think it took me ages to realize you know, you know obviously people are 
uh, it's everyone's in a spectrum and it doesn't matter what sex gender you are is you know some people want to be with one person and want to wait till they're married but most people are, are and some people want to have sex with everyone they meet most people are somewhere in between that yeah, and you know yeah. and women aren't you know women obviously it just took me ages to realize that <laughs> that I think that you know it it was that that women were were the same as men in that They're way. Just I think people. A, I think a lot of men don't a lot. Well, I think exactly if you're honest about it, but I think you think I think you're made to think. Oh, women will want a commitment. I was weirdly as a young man. I was I was very into the idea of commitment, and I but it was right. my parents. My parents had met when they were thirteen, and they're still together, and they're eighty three oh, wow. now. Oh my gosh, that's amazing! Um, and so. Um, I kind of thought that would be it. So I was actually quite prudish and um, and really believed my first girlfriend would be my wife and all that sort of stuff. So that was that was my backstory a little bit. But I think realizing that, yeah, I'm realizing that just being upfront and honest because you also I also realized all the people who'd hurt me in relationships had lied to me. You know, just they right. they'd been with you know something else had been going on, and if they just said oh, something else is going on, you go okay, well I have to. Uh, work right. out whether you know what I mean and so it's just realizing it's about the empathy and I think a lot of men aren't taught uh empathy a lot of men don't think of the world like that and hopefully they're getting better and this you know again I'm still talking about 2004 when I did this thing but that was I, I realized lots of things what about you it was a slightly different thing because you were you were dating men from your audience and presumably in quite a controlled and small way at I mean, you went at what you would go out for a drink with them after the show or did you yeah yeah so basically um and a lot of times they were volunteered <laughs> they weren't yeah. necessarily volunteering themselves and then we go for a drink in because I was at the courtyard so um yeah we just go for a drink in one of the marquee bars that have been set up there and and actually my rule was that they put the drinks out beforehand and so mine was a tonic water dressed up to look like a gin and tonic or whatever and they had a pint of beer and we just I think we'd have like two drinks and then that was it right but then the only the only thing is is like on the Friday night it was so heaving in the courtyard that I had to start we had to start going elsewhere because the bar would like set a little reserve you know the reserve a table for us and so you know it was really straightforward grab the drinks in the bar go and sit down done but on the Fridays because it was so busy we had to go somewhere yeah. so then it really felt like I was leaving the <laughs> sanctum of the courtyard do you know what I mean it's just like oh, I'm just gonna text all my friends and let them know where I'm going yeah. you know so and then yeah so that was a little bit weird but there was one guy I remember he was uh, he was quite young actually and I thought oh he's actually really nice but he had to go and meet his family afterwards oh. so he's he's he was like one of two people that I thought oh yeah I think I sort of think I found it interesting that when you know, especially with not really trying to match up with people that you want to match up with, and just like random, really, it was just like who who do you know who'd be up for this? And it, but but actually the number and the meeting because I would do like a whole evening with people uh, or or day a whole day sometimes, uh, and uh, you know you'd meet them and go yeah, and no, this person's not my type at all, you know, mm. this is they will just have a fun time. But actually, spend a couple of hours, two or three hours, with someone and really get to know them, and you kind of go, "Oh no, actually, I really like this person." And right. you wouldn't have immediately, I would never have chosen to go out with them. It was just ma- massively confusing, and I'm not saying it wasn't fun, uh, but it was. <laughs> I did end up going out with one of them for about a year afterwards. Uh, wow! End, but it, but it took quite a long time to get down to get down to one. And <laughs> narrow, narrow it down. <laughs> and then it didn't. It didn't work it. out. But it, but but it made me much more open to try and just go. You know, just to go on dates, yeah. which I think is an American. Th- you know, I think that's that's why you'd have in Scotland. And I know with a largely probably English audience, I think men are very reticent about. That's what I think men think that if you asking a woman on a date, then you sort of ask them to marry you. <laughs> and you know, it's not. You can't just go. Let's go out for a night and see it. You know, that we've. I thought of all the nights in my twenties that um, that I just stayed in the house on my own. That you could have just gone. Let's go out go, with yeah. any single person in the world because hey, you might meet them, but it's still better. You might meet someone, but you it's still better than just sitting at home on your own playing Civilization. You, too. You're right. <laughs> You're right yeah, about the cultural. No, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're right about the cultural thing, though, because I think we need more of that American style dating. Let's just hang out, go for some drinks, have dinner and not have any idea where it's going or any um, a sort of attachment to 
a second date or yeah. whatever comes next, you know, because we, we don't really do that. We, we just sort of stagger back to theirs and the next thing you're living together. <laughs> so a little bit of Well, that's space, what you but... do in your routine. You talk about not having dated for four years, but, you know, but that whole thing. <laughs> that's yeah, not yeah. Say I haven't, <laughs> I'm not going to say I haven't got drunk and gone back to someone's house. Yeah. But, um, you know, but it's, it is, that's a very Brit. it's a very British thing and then sometimes those sort of hookups will turn out to be something yeah. and sometimes they could have turned out to be something if they hadn't been sort of ridiculous drunken hookups so it's, oh, yeah, I, I, found it all, I found sure. it all very interesting but I find it interesting that you you must have made a choice to be single really be, through those times when you were saying you hadn't was that true you hadn't dated for four years or was that a, yeah. a comedy bit no no I mean it was longer than that actually because uh, I think it got to 10 years in the end. Right. Um, um, it was just the way it went. And it wasn't, f- well, I could say it's not for want of trying, but I probably I was doing something <laughs> to sort of repel people. But um, yeah, it's just the way it went. I was thinking the other day that uh, for me, there, it, I don't know if relationships fit. I, I genuinely, you know, you just have a, a, a conversation with yourself about stuff. And maybe that I'm not cut out for that, whatever it is. And for me, I'm just like, maybe I'm genuinely not cut out for relationships because they don't stick. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's, well, it may be true. And I think, I mean, you know, I think I was the same though, you know, I'm thinking like until I, I was ready to, for a relationship when I met my wife, but it, but when I met my wife, it was like, it was suddenly quite different even than the more serious right. relationships I'd had before it was mm-hmm. it was there was something that you know I wanted to like change my right. entire lifestyle <laughs> because my lifestyle especially when I was coming at the 40 was like that probably at my my sort of most uh uh What's the word? <laughs> Most uh, yes, <laughs> you know, back an alien. Is that the right word? I'm not trying, but it was you know, I was I was out having a good time as I approached forty, and also, but but also, like there was something in me that was deeply wrong. You know, I was I was unhappy. I think uh-huh. so. I think I think I kind of needed to find the right person, and then suddenly it sort of made sense. But I would have said, you know, certainly through my twenties, I thought, you know, I'm not really I had a couple of girlfriends in my twenties. I think, but. You know, not that I, I, it was, you know, I thought maybe I'm not, that's not going to happen to me uh-huh, in the same uh-huh. way. So, you know, I think you never know. I mean, I think it must be, it must be a choice you're making. Um, you're a very intelligent and articulate and attractive woman. So you, there, there should be no problem with you, uh, yeah, finding people. But- those aren't the things, are they, really? So, it's, 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 some, it's something other than that, because otherwise, why did Jay- Jay-Z cheat on Beyonce? Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying on Beyonce, but, like, you know what I mean? If she can get cheated on or have a dodgy relationship or whatever, yeah. then that doesn't, that can't be it. <laughs> the, the attractive, well, it does, sort of intelligent bit can't be it. I think that all that sort of stuff is a... Is a well, no, but it's just getting into the relationship, you know, whether people cheat on people is another issue. That's but true. I think, but <laughs> That's get, true. getting into the relationship, deciding to have a relationship, I think it, you know, it's interesting and it's interesting you did a show about it. And I've, I've seen that a few times people doing, doing, you know, and obviously I've done, it wasn't the show, my show in the end wasn't really about, <laughs> about that, which it should, that should have been the show. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's obviously, it's interesting to see that but yeah but equally there's no reason you have to be in a relationship and there's no reason you know that that in a lot of ways i think in the modern world you know less people should be in relationships because we got think you're right. the world <laughs> uh, you know to be honest with you i also in my mind i associate them with trouble like like i've got life just down you know what i mean like i've just got things sorted i have to, i do things my way and i like the thing whoopi goldberg said is like they, someone asked her like why is she not in a relationship or why hasn't she got married again and she was like i don't want anyone else in my house <laughs> <laughs> it's just like do you know babe i get you i don't want anyone in my house either <laughs> i do you know I, I i can absolutely see it and i but it's sort of interesting because you're i found it your, your book which i'm about halfway through i've listened to the audio book and it's not the kind of book i think i would usually have uh-huh. picked up in this a uh, romantic comedy <laughs> but but it's got a bit more interesting that kind of made me wonder why more comedians a lot of comedians have written like kids books but mm-hmm. not many comedians have gone into writing that sort of romantic comedy relationship style books and you would think they would because so many comedians <laughs> acts are about that yeah uh, and it's really you know it's clever what you've done and it's you know it's 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 beyond what people would do in a stand-up act, and it's a complicated story about three friends and their various 
uh, their various sort of dating disasters and trying to sort that out. But it's quite, you know, it's a romantic book where I've heard you say that all three characters are, are based on you, but they're all quite different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I... um. I'm not there yet in terms of like people being interested in an autobiography. So I thought it would be nice as well to just take like, like little parts of my life and who I am and put that in the book. So the oldest one is definitely me now. She's kind of a bit shut off to love. The middle one is very, so she's in her thirties and she is just like desperate to find love. And she keeps thinking, Oh, this guy's the one, this guy's the one. And the youngest one is, is 29. So she's very, she compartmentalizes everything. She's got a plan. She knows how she wants her life to play out. And not all of them are going to get, they get wake up call in different ways because of where they're looking from um, yeah. through the course of the book. But I also like, I wanted to write something that was kind of, that spoke to female friendship as well and just the yeah. truth of it. So it's kind of a bit of a romance about female friendship as well as about sort of intimate relationships as well. Yeah. And was that something you always wanted to get into? Cause it's, you're a very clever woman, right? I have to say this. You've won my, you've won mastermind twice and that's not even possible. That's, that's actually true. Yes. <laughs> so I, I didn't, I'm very jealous. I didn't win the time I was on and I was, and I'm very clever. You are uh, very clever. So I'm very annoyed that you've got two, <laughs> you're, you're infinity times better than me with one. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, it, and it's, a, it's, you know, it's writing a book is hard, right? And I saw you talk oh, about writing yeah. and talking about the creative, the creative process of writing and saying, you know, you've just got to get that first draft out and then, mm. and then start writing the book. Um, but it's it's a big undertaking, right, to write a, a book, and it's it's is is that is that what if you, if you wanted to do that for a, a long time? I know you've been writing plays and uh, TV stuff. Is is a novel it, that it were it was and it wasn't in the sense of you know people talk about oh you know everyone's got a book in them and all that. So I wanted to give it. I've always wanted to give it a go, but there's never really been time. But then I happened to meet a great agent who hooked me up with a great publisher and so you know they were really keen to I, I pitched them the idea and they were really keen to to go with it so I was like okay shit now I've got to write a book oh wait first I've got to learn how to write a book so <laughs> even though you know your fantasies about uh you know being a novelist the the mechanics of actually doing it my god I mean that's it's definitely the hardest creative thing I've ever done because yeah. I didn't know what I was doing I mean most of the time I don't know what I'm doing but I particularly <laughs> didn't know what I was doing with this thing so um yeah I did want to do it but I just didn't know how and I didn't know what I was letting myself in for yeah and it's great that you do the 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 audio book because we get you know there's it's a funny it's a funny novel and it's not just funny it's uh, you know it's a, it is as you say about relationships and you know there's there's a there's a lot to it but it's nice to hear the author not every author could perform their own book as as well as as you could as well i suppose was there was there was that ever a question that you were you wouldn't going to do it yourself well uh, only probably halfway through when i was like <laughs> i don't know what i'm doing again um it's kind of daunting actually because it, i suddenly realized like how responsible i am for communicating the story to the listeners yeah. Like this is a real thing. <laughs> it's I've got to treat this like a job, <laughs> you know what I mean? Rather than just me reading out my book and spotting like typos or whatever. It's like a <laughs> yes. proper, proper thing. So um, but I really I wanted to do it because I know these women so well and I know the story. So it felt like to me, it felt like natural that I I would read it. But I get how other authors would want somebody else to as well. They, you know, they've done their bit. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I just yeah. want to you might just want to relax now rather than then have to do like an audience audio voice recording thing it's a hard you know my book that i've just done is a short book i think comparatively it's only like twenty five thousand words and that still took two days to record so you must have been doing like a sort of week's worth of recording you oh yeah it was you a week never, yeah yeah and you and the, the funny thing is is even though i wrote it i was still tripping up over stuff again <laughs> oh wait what did i what did i No. oh yeah okay all right all right let me just sit again wait 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 I, I i can do this i can do this producer was so patient with me bless them but uh yeah it's not a given that you'll you'll know what you were talking about <laughs> <laughs> right i'm gonna ask some emergency questions we did some before Great. Uh, yeah, they, you were good. It was good for the badgers. They're gonna love it. Um, 
I'm going to ask you, have you ever seen a ghost? That's oh, my very important question for that's you. That's really interesting. Do you know, I've been asked that a few times and I wish I could say yes, because uh -huh. I do believe in them as uh, in theory. Yeah. But I've never seen one. I do not want to see one. I don't <laughs> want to experience one. I don't want to experience anything supernatural. I am like the most susceptible person when it comes to films based on the supernatural. Right. So even just this conversation has given me the heebie-jeebies. That's where I'm at with it. So well, you can't see my spooky. I've got a very spooky <laughs> attic behind it. I know you, you haven't got. I know you haven't got a Union Jack up in you behind you. I don't know if that's no. See, you, see, just, just do you over... hate Britain? Is you hate? Do you hate Britain? Because I love Britain. No, my what's... my my portrait of the Queen, which yeah. is ceiling to floor. Okay, may I say it's just over here. So whatever. Because right. yeah. I've got quite a big uh, flag. Back there. That's what I'm just well, I've I also love... got her diversity officer, a picture of them right beside right beside her, keeping it real. <laughs> Good. Uh, I and um, uh, let me. Out. I've got. To... Oh, if. Uh, uh, I'll ask you this: If you yes. could, if you had a finger that could travel through time, where would you send your finger to, and what would it do? In in, in any, it could go in the future and go into the past. Oh, which what finger? It, well, any finger of your choice. There's just a finger-sized hole to the past. You can go back and alter time with your finger, so you could just put your finger in and change something, or just feel feel something in history. You okay, wanna, I think what... what I might do is I might just. Go back to when Justin Timberlake ripped off Janet Jackson's like thing. <laughs> yeah. Just put put my thumb across and save her dignity. Save everyone a lot of trouble. She wouldn't get so, cancelled. Yeah. Right? He'd yeah. be he wouldn't have to like do some weird grovelly apology. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's a winner. Yeah, that's that's good. Not that far back in his, isn't it? You know, I suppose I suppose Martin. It's probably would fly. like twenty years or something, isn't it? Well, I suppose it's a while now, actually, yeah. I mean that is history. You're right. We're so old. We're so old. <laughs> <laughs> we are. It's all. It's all too terrible to, <laughs> to worry about. Uh, and uh, this is a, a newer emerged question that isn't in the book. Oh. Um, if you could, if all the world's art galleries and museums got together and said, "We love Andy, mm -hmm. and we're going to let her have one thing of her choice from any museum or art gallery in the world, and she can keep it," I can see you're already. You've you've got a lot of taste. I can tell just from. The My colour Ikea scheme of your wall. On you, the wall. <laughs> you've got a lovely painting up there that's probably worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. Ikea's finest. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, which, is there something you would like from a museum or an art gallery that you Other would like than to the own? box office take. You um, could take that. You could take that. I don't <laughs> no, know if they've no, got no. lots of money. In there. They, they oh, if you they, want money, you know, just take an expensive painting and then sell it. Yeah, that's true. No, I'm not right. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. What, d mm, this is difficult. Yeah. Jewelry? Do I want? There's jewelry? a lot of jewelry. Well, you know, there's some nice jewels. There's uh, Tutankhamun's jewels. They're probably quite nice. Um, they're I quite like some of. There's some stuff in the. I saw the Tutankhamun exhibition. Uh, well, just before lockdown, I guess it was, or maybe the year before. And there's some really good, fantastic big sort of guard statues. There's a little pencil case. I'd quite like. Oh, Tutankhamun. pencil case. Oh, I love Tutankhamun's love, pencil case. I love stationery. Yeah, I'll take yeah. that. I'll take the pencil case. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good. woman of simple simple needs. I'll take the pencil case. Done. It's <laughs> good. And uh, how many cheese graters do you own in, in your house? Um, I did have three or four, but I'm, yeah. I'm down to one. But one like that's like a hexagon shape, so it's got all the different. Yeah, I've, got, on I've got one. Of, yeah, I've got yeah. two of those, yeah. and I've got. Um, I don't just, eat you know, cheese. That, I'm doing pretty well. That's all I'm saying. I've got quite a lot of cheese graters. Is it? <laughs> what okay. happened to the three or four? Is did they break the three or four? Or did you lose them, or did you give them give, um, give them to other people? Normally I like Ikea, but this is a fail on their part. It was right. one of those ones where it was like a Tupperware, but instead of it being a lid, it was a grater. Yeah, I've got one of those as well. Uh, I don't like it. No, no I don't, I don't like use it. it. Don't no, exactly. There you go. So, yeah. Did you get your fingers? Could you, it's, it's a bit more likely to catch your fingers, I think, as well. I don't know what it was about. It was like, it's, you're trying to make the whole grating game too complicated. <laughs> so don't try and be clever. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm just that's a that's a question that sees, shows whether you're keeping it real and whether you're still a normal person despite all your success. And having one greater is, you know, that's, yeah. that's pretty down to earth and normal. Uh, and talking of audio books, I'll ask you this question, and then we'll go back to talking about you. Uh. Um, uh, if you could have any one from the past before there were audio books to do their own audio book. Oh, okay. Like so, you know, you know, go back in time before their audio books, before their recordings. Is there anyone you'd like to hear? Oh, I mean, it could be someone who just hasn't done their own audio book who's alive. Right. Is there right, anyone right. you would like? To, is there any uh, author 
that you would like to hear read their own audiobooks? Someone must have said the Bible if you've asked that before. Well, I don't know if they ha- what you so written read by God or read oh, by the people yes, who wrote. Yes, yeah. read by God. No, I don't want to hear the people that wrote it. I want to hear <laughs> in God's. I want to hear what God's accent is. <laughs> yeah, like does he does he have like. Uh, you know, Middle Eastern accent, or is it more this like indecipherable, omnipotent sort of vibe he's got going on? Like, what, yeah. what, what, what's the tone? I wonder as well. It'd be the same when you know what you mentioned when you read your own book over for an audio book. You notice all the mistakes. <laughs> I wonder if he'd go, "Oh fuck, why did I do that? That was bad when I did that to Job. <laughs> what was I thinking?" I meant like just sparkling water <laughs> into like still water, not wine. I, like, I come across crazy in some of this stuff. <laughs> And I seem so vengeful. What's up with that? Guys, I'm a really nice person. All right, let me go again. Sorry, sorry. My bad, my bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be amazing. Cool. And so what, what's coming up in the future, Andy? There's, uh, is there more acting roles on the way? More books? More podcasts? Do you yes, do a blog? All, 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 all of those things, Richard. Yeah. That's that's my life right yeah. now. So um, you're, are you writing a new book? Is, is it this, with the same characters or with new characters? No, new world, new yeah. characters. So I'm just um, uh, oh, two thirds of the way through the first draft of it. Again, Great. it takes a really long time. <laughs> it's, always... it's horrible writing books. It's the worst. It, and I just write stupid books and it's horrible. But it's still, it's still tough, isn't it? It's it just is, like it you is. just literally... The thing is, you just have to sit down and do it. There's no sort of fast tracking. I mean, there's no fast tracking with any sort of creative stuff, really, but particularly with books, you literally have to write all the words. They have to be good words that people like <laughs> and will understand. So, yeah, so I'm in but the middle I, of doing that. I think it's like, I think, again, it was, uh, forgive me if this wasn't you because I've been reading a few things, but I think today I, 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 that you were talking about how it's very easy when you're writing to kind of just fixate on the one bit you're doing in the first oh. craft and try and get it put rather than just spewing it out. And yeah. that's what I find very hard. I'll just like be, I'll be stuck for days and then go, oh, look, just even just if you write blah, 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 and then get on to the next bit. Mate. Don't just try and make every little bit perfect as you go the first time. When I gave my permi- myself permission to have placeholders, and really got that as an idea of like a way to just like keep the keep the writing flowing. It just changed everything. So someone said to me, um, was it in Ain't No Sunshine? The I know, I know, I know, I know is a placeholder. Oh, right. They were going to, you know, he meant to write some words, <laughs> some, some different <laughs> words than he had already used. But it, so placeholders work like yeah. all the, sometimes they can be just good enough i am gonna my book is gonna be filled with i know i know i know <laughs> that could work, <laughs> and that, that could work. yeah it could work be good. So, i yeah. think it's weird because sometimes you do get into a, you know usually for me it's when the deadline is two days away mm. and then suddenly i can write very easily and very quickly and and, and it comes out pretty good but it's like with stand-up as well i think sometimes you come up with a routine that on stage and it just falls out of your mouth and it's mm. sort of perfect and sometimes you sit at home trying to make that work and and actually you'll just get up on stage and the right words will suddenly come out on stage in the heat of the moment and I I, I guess for me it's always just for me it's always deadlines and you know forcing myself to do things where I have to be creative it does focus the mind (laughs) if you're improvising (laughs) life uh, then you kind of have to get going with it right and also before you go we'll let you go in a sec you've been lovely giving giving up your love your time it's been a pleasure do buy the book. Uh, it's called Asking for a Friend. I don't think I've even said that. Oh, no, we didn't say that, did we? Um, yeah. uh, and uh, it's, you know, blokes don't buy it. No man is going to read it. But all the girls out there. <laughs> it's for no, the ladies. I, I, I enjoyed it. I did, it meant <laughs> open yourselves up to your empathy. It'll help you guys. No, it's really good. Um, you, a Reiki teacher. I don't know what Reiki is. Oh, gosh. I might have to remove that. Um, where is that? On uh, on Wikipedia or something? I think it might be on IMDb. Oh, right, IMDb. Yeah. yeah. Well, is I that did not that true? years ago. No, it's totally true, but I don't know if I could still do it. I mean, in theory, you never you never lose the power, but um, you. I think you have to be practicing regularly, but um, it's the kind of um, sort of energy healing thing. Yeah. That, uh, but, you, yeah, I think you have to be practicing. I'm more in the um, taking the mickey out of it now. <laughs> rather than the actually doing it <laughs> but you're sort of sp- you're quite a spiritual person without i don't know if you are religious i don't get the vibe that you're religious but you've you've, you've sort of feel from the stuff i've read about you to be quite spiritual and to be quite into that sort of self-improvement and that sort of thing so yeah. is, it, is it is it part of that strand of your yeah for sure i mean i i just uh, i like 
I don't know anything, but I'm curious <laughs> about stuff. That's the thing yeah. for me. And I just can't quite reconcile that this is this is it. This is the limit of 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 hu- the human experience is just the material stuff. I think that's part of it, but I think there's more to it than that. And I and I'm interested to find out what that is. But I don't want to um you know, have finite answers. I, I think being in the question is so much more I- interesting than knowing the answers. And maybe that's all we're here to do is just to be in this constant question. But people don't like not knowing. They like, they like you know, I know. <laughs> and so that's why we always argue about stuff. But yeah, yeah that's my thing is that I just like to be in the question. But that's why you, you know, that's why you gravitated towards stand up because that's sort of, stand up's all about asking questions and not having to give answers, really. I think it's, it's, it's pointing out where the the world is wrong and where things are silly, but it's not. It very rarely gives any answers, and if it does, it's not any. They're not, they're any not good answers. Any, they're, <laughs> they're not, not answers to, to live by. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very. Look, you're, I think you're an amazing. You're a force of nature. You're doing so well in so many different uh, different disciplines. It's it, it's it's incredible, uh, and Thank I wish you. you very good luck with all of these things, and uh, hope we see you. You know, doing some non-photograph acting soon. <laughs> that would be good if you are moving. If you're moving around, that that's the next. Do you know what the they next. did with? Because so one of the things that I did on the show was like I because I, you know I'm a, a journalist, so they, one of the bits of archive footage that we shot, they put a link to it as Morse code on the box of ibuprofen that Steve. <laughs> Uh, Arnold bought in the, and someone found it oh, really yeah I didn't even know but they tagged me on Twitter and I was just like the hell these people are good <laughs> like there's all little easter eggs all over the place not then not it's not just about the chizzes it's like there's a lot of, there's a lot going on well I haven't I'm probably the only person in the country who hasn't seen a single second of Line of Duty all right, and so I do, you don't know what I'm talking I about no at I all. do but yes, I've, so, I've heard so many people talking about it I still know all about what's in it <laughs> but I uh but I am, you know, it sounds like a great series, and it is one of these. It is one of these universal shows, which is hard to get now, where yeah. pretty much everyone has seen it. So it's a, it's a really big deal, and I'm delighted that, uh, you know, I'm glad, delighted, even if you are just a photograph, which I'm sure you. <laughs> I mean, you're Thank listed you. in IMDb in every episode. I don't know if they're just flashing the photo around. I don't know who did that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> they're putting your Reiki teacher in there. They're doing I know exactly, like exactly. That. They're putting us off. Well, no, I, I'm sure there will be much more from you, and it's uh, it's really terrific to see you. A back in the UK, but also sort of exploding everywhere. So go and buy those books, listen to the podcast, and uh, check out all those fantastic shows. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, we'll be back next week, probably, uh, if you're watching on Twitch. We'll definitely be back next week if you listen to the podcast. I don't know who my guest will be. It's all dependent on <sighs> health funny. issues. We'll see. Aww. It might be my... I'm trying to persuade my wife to do one, but we'll see. Yes, we'll see. that will be we'll brilliant. That... Yeah, it'll be fun, wouldn't it? I mean, yeah. it might not be brilliant, Andy. It might be the end of our marriage. No, don't say that. <laughs> just, it will be brilliant. If we start, what if we start arguing like we argue when you know when the camera's not on us? It, um, that no. will be brilliant. I'll be tuning. I'll be on Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for making the Annie Show. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. How'd you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>